Okay, so it's exactly 11 o'clock. Let's get into this. I'm gonna kick off uh, with a video. Hey Siri, I need to talk to iBrad. Running your shortcut. I've got a photo here and I want to add a few people to my guest list. Can you help me out, Brad? No, Brad. Don't worry if you can't read the text, I'm going to go through it. Using three guests added, but you may want to look at a larger venue. Mm, I don't get it. Why? Capacity shown below. I hate this. It's already costing me a fortune. Telling him it's pretty confident about the prediction. Uh, okay, uh, book the uh, larger venue with the organizer, and ha how'd you know I was anxious? Hmm. When I was doing the um, the practice runs with this, I was going to have the chat go a lot longer where it was going to be Brad saying, you know, I haven't been very busy lately, not much has been happening this year, so I can go and book the conference for you. But um, Brad's actually here at the back and he's seen it, so I decided to pull that out just in case he did this. So thanks for rocking up and seeing it, Brad. <laughs> and hopefully we still have a job, Johan. I'm not sure we'll be speaking next year, though. <laughs> so just so, thanks very much, mate. All right, so as you probably know, uh, we're going to be doing a talk about artificial intelligence. Um, to tell you a little bit about Johan and myself, I'm more kind of hands-on with the client. So I work with a client to help them understand what AI can do for them. Uh, Johan's more technical, so he kind of gets all the stuff to work. So what we're going to do today is I'm going to spend uh, the first probably 20 minutes just going through all the different types of artificial intelligence or machine learning that are being daisy-chained together to get that experience to work. And what we've all discovered this morning from the keynote is that this is going to become much easier. So Johan's used all his advanced FileMaker skills to get all this stuff to work, but if we're to take them on their word, it sounds like this is stuff that we're all going to be able to do very easily and very quickly. Um, so I think it's very exciting. I think it's great that you've come. Um, as the keynote was running through, and I was saying to Johan, oh, you know, they're all going to turn up, and then they did the whole thing. It's, we're going to talk to you all about Claris Connect right next door. Um, I think perhaps and so we've got less people than I, think we were, than I think we would have had otherwise. But the thing about coming to this session, the stuff you're going to learn today are the fundamental, princip the fundamental principles about daisy chaining or using different types of machine learning so that you can give the user an experience of artificial intelligence. So I think it's great that you're here, and I think what you get to take away with you is the fundamental skills so that when it becomes easier, you should be able to set these things up much quicker. Now we thought it would be a good idea to kind of tell you a bit about ourselves with a photo. And so I picked this photo of my, my two kids, Lily and Nate. Uh, Lily's three, Nate's five, and they're obviously the center of my world, so I thought I'd throw it there. And what they're doing there is playing in a cardboard box. Anyone who's got kids, I'm sure you've gone through this. Bought them a lovely trampoline, very expensive. It's sitting out the back, sparkling and brand new. They're playing in the bloody cardboard box that it came in, and they spent the whole day in the cardboard box, so I could have saved myself a lot of money there. Yoan then put this as his photo, and I don't, I'm not sure if you can see, but he's there doing push-ups, you know, on the end of that rock. I looked at his photo, and I looked at my photo, I thought, he makes me look like a complete douchebag. So I changed my photo to this. This is me <laughs> surfing a barrel on one of the beaches uh, at, at, at Manly in Sydney. Um, and then I thought, the proportions still aren't quite right, so I think the slide that describes us is probably... <laughs> best shown to be something like this. All right, so I mentioned that we talked about AI last year. If you did come to last year's session, you would have seen this slide, which is one of the reasons you're seeing us talk about artificial intelligence. So I've been working with AI for about 20 years, and I really wasn't allowed to talk about it up until about 2017. 
because people thought I was kidding or people thought Terminator and they just didn't take me seriously. So I really honestly couldn't bring it up with any of my clients. Then in 2017, you can see it there just on the slide. This is just from Google Trends, so you don't have to trust me. This You can go and do a Google trend on artificial intelligence or AI versus iOS. So I just picked another term and a term that we're all familiar with. But I mean, iOS, it's a platform for a company. Artificial intelligence is a general technology. And yet, up until 2017, more people were interested in iOS than they were in AI. Now, in 2017, something different happened. And when we gave the talk last year, I said, as you can see from the chart, and you can check the facts yourself, people are twice as interested in AI as they are in iOS. I thought, you might be interested in what's been happening since then. So in the last 12 months, what's happened? Look at the end of the chart. Probably four times more interesting for people. People are four times more interested in AI. So I think you've come to the right session because I spoke to Brad last year and he asked me one question. He said, are we too early for AI? Is the right time for AI or are we too late? I don't think we're too early, definitely, because our customers aren't ready for it or a lot of my customers are still discovering their way through it. So when, you know, we're not too early, we're not too late. I think we're just right. I think we're, this is just about the right time to be getting into it. So I'm glad that you've come to this session. I did want to start it by talking to you about the definition of AI that Johan and I share. And the reason I need to do that is because in the early days, I got distracted by people wanting to debate with me what AI is. Now, there's a, um, there's a whole uh, one-hour free webinar that you can go to where I do talk about neural networks, which is what some people associate with AI. It's where machine learning uh, learns on its own and doesn't need all the inputs and can do some pretty fancy um, algorithms, but you can see from the expression on my face just how much I like talking about that stuff. It's, I'm looking real angry. I'm not sure they videoed me having a tantrum really for an hour talking about pure AI. Um, instead, I think what we're more interested in is spending all of our time on applied AI. So what, do cust what can customers benefit from when we look at artificial intelligence? And you saw Alan Turing. So in the keynote just now, that photo was Alan Turing. And last year, we did spend a little bit of time on pure AI, and we talked about the Turing test. So if you wanted to win in a you know, pub debate about AI, you probably want to look up the Turing test. And we talked about that last year, but I'm not going to get into it this year. Um, we talked about enterprise AI, chatbots, conversational user interfaces. I'll just pause on that for a moment. This, to me, was one of the most exciting areas that we're working in as FileMaker developers. Conversational user interface is where you're having the chatbot working, right, as you saw in that video. But as you're having the discussion, in FileMaker, you can be monitoring what is being said. So instead of just having a typical chat where there's text coming in, text coming out, you can intercept the user interface and send them off to a chart or to a picture or to something else. So instead of it just being a conversation, it's a conversational user interface. And as FileMaker developers, it'll take you but seconds to do that. Once you've understood how to connect to the chatbot and, and see what's happening in the conversation, you can change the user interface as you're going. I say it used to be the most exciting thing because something that Heidi, uh, so we did some lightning talks yesterday and um, Heidi introduced me to another area of machine learning which I find much more interesting and I'm gonna get to that just a little bit later on. So then machine learning, key area of artificial intelligence. Multi-dimensional fractal derivatives. You'd be, yep, that's a good yawn. That, that yawn was perfectly timed. I will not be talking about multi-dimensional fractal derivatives today unless you corner me in the bar tonight and then I'll talk to you about it all night. Gary can even talk to you about it. Now, I've told Gary about him so much, he could probably relay the message. Um, and last year, we did a roadmap. So if you're interested in implementing AI in a business, we went through the steps. I'm not going to go through that today, but if you want to come up and talk to me later on, like you'd like to get into this right now and start working with it with your clients, then I can show you, we've got the slide, I can show you the slide I used last year, which is all about how to implement it in the client. So all that stuff happened last year. The thing we're going to drill into today is image recognition. So what we're going to do is we're going to give you an example and talk you through how you can use like seven or eight different types of machine learning, and I consider it like daisy chaining them together. So you're skipping from one type of machine learning to the next, and what kind of experience can you get from that? So I'm not gonna play the video again. Um, you've seen it before, so this is the video that we just played. So I'm gonna skip. I'll hey Siri, that's I the one. So I'm gonna skip past that. No one wants to say that again, right? You're okay with it? Um, what I'm going to do is talk to you about the different types of machine learning that we used to get that like chatbot AI app working. Does anyone like that transition? That took me ages to get that transition. I love, I love that magic move in Keynote. Um, let's just, here we go. So let's go through them. 
the first bit of machine learning was voice to text. So that's the one you're all familiar with. I would call that public because you can talk to Siri at any time. You can say, hey Siri, and she responds, and she's got no idea what you're about to say. There could be an infinite number of things you're saying, and she needs to work out from those infinite possibilities what is it you're about to talk about. Um, NLP is natural language processing. So after she converts your voice to text, she needs to work out from that text, what is it you're saying? What's the meaning? What is the um, context? What are the nouns? What are the verbs? What are the adjectives? Like, what's going on here? She needs to interpret all that. And then it's not really machine learning. It's a pretty simple match. I have iOS shortcuts running as well, where Siri is listening for a certain phrase. And she's listening. And what you can see over there on to the right is where it says, you know, the iBrad shortcut. There's only two steps to that shortcut. First one is go and get the file, which is your FileMaker Go app that you've custom built sitting on your iOS device. So go and get that file. And when you get it, open it in this application, which is FileMaker Go 18. Um, the shortcut, so as, as I, so you're not going to get the sound now, so don't, the sound guys couldn't get the sound working, but there's not supposed to be sound here, so don't, don't freak. Um, while all this is going on, you can see to the right this time, that shortcut of just those two steps has been saved, and the Siri phrase, I need to talk to iBrad, is what triggers that shortcut to run. So the thing that scares all of us, Siri's listening to us all the time, otherwise how could she know we've just said, hey Siri. So Siri's listening the whole time, she hears the hey Siri, then she's waiting for the command, and then when she hears I need to talk to iBrad, fires off the shortcut, your app is now open. Now with your app being open, we're gonna go back through the same kind of steps. She's gonna convert your voice into text, and that text can be analyzed through natural language processing, but now it's happening inside of your FileMaker app. So I refer to this as private NLP, private natural language processing. The fun thing about this is now that it's inside your app, you've got a choice. All that text is appearing. You can send that text back out again to another, to another API that's got machine learning and let the external API or the machine learning analyze what was just said and bring you back some JSON information and you're gonna see some of that happening with Johan. Or if you're a complete masochist, you could try to build it yourself inside of FileMaker. So one of the questions we got yesterday after the lightning talk was can you do this inside of FileMaker? And again, I'm not going to get into the details now, but I built some algorithms using custom functions, so tail recursive ones that are iterative, and it's got some statistics built into it. So the algorithms look like they're getting smarter. What's actually happening is the user is behaving differently, so standard deviations come down and all the parameters start to change. But that's effectively machine learning. Chatbot as well, I decided that, you know, I'm sure I'm not the only one person in the room, but after I saw how, we were using Google's um, API.ai, and after we'd been using it for so long, I was like, really? Pretty sure I could build this myself. So I kind of went off and built a chatbot inside of FileMaker. So the, the thing to take away is that you're watching the whole conversation go. So during that conversation, if you want to just trigger a script to do something internally, go for your life. If you've got no idea what they're saying, then you can just take that whole body of text or the image or the video, or whatever's going on, the audio, and send it off to an external machine learning algorithm to give you the answer nicely packaged. So we're now using four different types of machine learning. Um, that's just the link to last year's talk. Um, the next two, image recognition, object counting, and prediction. So the chat, it, the, uh, what we said to the chat bot was, you know, I've got um, an image here and I want to add some people to an event. So that's triggered the chat bot to say, oh, well, you've got an image, have you? Show me the image. So you take a photo on the spot or maybe you pull it up from your you know, photo library. You give the image to the chat bot in terms of what the user's seen. The user's thinking you're giving the, uh, the photo to the chat bot. But what actually happens is, Johan's scripts run and it sends that image out to AWS AWS analyzes the image and then comes back with all sorts of information. And we're gonna go, and Johan's gonna take you through a lot more of the details that you can extract from that returned message. The one I wanted was how many people are in the image. And the chatbot saw that there are three, and check that out, it's 99.5% confident that with three people in that photo. So then it said, okay, I'm gonna add three people to the event. And as you saw, um, when it added the three people, it also said, oh, hang on a second, you've almost reached capacity, and you're only like halfway through the month, and it's at the end of the month. So the chatbot took an extra step. Instead of just saying, and that's what you saw out there with the workflows, like instead of just saying, oh yeah, I've added three people to the event, we'll send them an invoice, we can go a step further as well. You can do a bit of management now. You can kind of look at it and go, oh, we're gonna run out of capacity. Hey, you better order a, a bigger facility. Now just this ability to count things, 
I'm hoping that there are people in the room that are thinking, I'm going to go back on Monday and start saving, I don't know if you get to save seven hours into like 30 seconds, but if you've got people that are doing stock takes, or even customers that count stuff and then work out what to order from you, there is some really low hanging fruit for you out there. There's some machine learning, and this is a, just one example of many, countingthings.com, where if you're doing a stock take and there's like a, you know, a thousand steel rods, take a photo of the ends of the rods and it'll count them all up for you. Uh, 500 sheets, take a photo, it'll count them up for you. So in a few seconds, it can count all these objects for you, which means machine learning is doing what people can do, but seven hours in half a minute. It can also do stuff that's a real struggle. How would you like to be the intern that gets told to go and count how many people are at this event? Before you got to the end of it, you'd probably be getting it wrong. But there's machine learning that's been designed to count massive amounts of numbers like the number of people at this event. And again, there's the link, uh, analytics video. You can just go online and um, when Joe did his lightning talk yesterday, you just go to these websites and you just give them an image and it gives you a quick example within just a few seconds of the kind of stuff it can return. So all this counting is pretty cool. Uh, the next thing that happened in the video was the prediction. And this is the area um, that it puts you know, food on the table for me at home. I kind of like this shot. This is uh, a network map. And what this is trying to show you is that imagine you've got a business and each node or each dot on there is a business entity. A business entity could be a person, could be a client, could be a product. Um, these are all tangible entities, but it could be intangible entities, like a brand or something else. And all of these entities are related to, other, to each other in some way. So as I'll put into FileMaker speak, you build a bridging table to connect companies to products. So that's like an event. All the lines are showing in the connections between all your entities. So what AI, or what machine learning sees when it sees this is a bunch of patterns. I then um, use some algorithms to look at how these patterns are changing over time and then predict what's going to happen in the future. Um, and I've done this for some real clients, and two that have allowed me to talk about it. One is Mars, so that's like the chocolate company. Um, when I started working for them, I discovered they're the sixth largest private company in the US. So these are not small companies that are using, and I'm using FileMaker with them, um, and I did it for Unilever as well. And in both cases, it was a case of having a very simple chatbot running in FileMaker Go, where the user is talking to it. So in the Mars case, the engineer is talking to the chatbot. The chatbot says, hey, I think you should go and fix this machine. It's about to break down. So the predictive thing was trying to predict when machines are going to break down. But because you've got all of these connections, it, like a, a human probably could have done that. A human could sit there, analyze the performance of the machines, and say, oh, that one's going to break down next. But what a human probably couldn't do or would really struggle to do is to see two machines that are about to break down and go, oh, which one should I send the engineer to? Should I send that machine or that machine? What my algorithm did was look at the supply chain. Which machine has greater stock pressure? So in other words, if machine A has products that are out of stock, machine B is overstocked, where do you send the engineer? Send them over this machine, because we're almost out of stock. So this ability for AI and machine learning to see lots of different things is what gives it some real value. Um, that's just the reference of where I got that photo from. And now I said to you before, um, the conversational user interface used to be my favorite thing. When we were preparing for our lightning talks, um, Heidi and Joe and Johan and myself were emailing each other, trying to, trying to set ourselves up. And um, I sent Heidi an email and I said, oh, here's some ideas for our talk. Um, you know, I'm, I hope they're good. I'm feeling a really good mood. I'm at my favorite cafe and it's sunny. I'm in Sydney and I'm having a really good day. So I kind of got a bit kooky and creative. I hope you like this. Which I thought was, I was just trying to be polite, you know? I like Heidi, I want to kind of work with her some more. So a day later I get this email saying, I was just checking to see if you really did feel like that. She took all the text from the email, put it into a tone analyzer, and then got the results and sent me back the results of what the machine learning thought about the feelings I had. Now, that's pretty cool, right? What it's doing is looking at the words that are being used, natural language processing, and it's associating different words with different feelings. So if you say, oh, oh no, I don't know what to do, you know, it might think that you're anxious. Or if you say something really strong, it might, it might think that you're angry. So thanks, Heidi, for introducing me to tone analysis. And um, Joe, who also did a lightning talk, showed us just how much data you can extract from these images. Um, I said to you before how quickly you can go and test this. So uh, you can download the slides, so you'll be able to see the URL. The thing I found most fun was when Heidi sent me the reply, I thought it was hilarious, but then she said, here is a link you can go to to test, it, test this out yourself. 
And so I just sat there for hours going through all these different emails and texts and a lot of them my wife and I talked to her about the budget. I was like, oh, let's go and paste that into this thing, see what she was feeling. And you can just paste this text in on, from the URL, so you don't need to go and set it up in FileMaker, just go to the URL, paste the text in, hit analyze, and it goes in and says, like, this was a joyous tone. And it breaks it down to more information. Here are the different tones that I found. Here's where I found them inside the text, and here's the confidence I had, less than 50% or greater than 75% that this is the tone that we were getting from the text that you just got. Here's an interesting point. You can start to triangulate. So we're talking about daisy chaining different types of machine learning together, right? So you could take the text, send that off to one machine learning algorithm. That machine learning algorithm says, oh, Luke's nervous. He's up here speaking. Then you could send a picture of my face to another machine learning algorithm, and it looks at the expression of my face, and it says, oh, Luke's nervous. Then you can send it off to another machine learning algorithm that listens to my voice, and because I've got a cold, I might be covering the fact that Luke's nervous. So these three different machine learning algorithms who are triangulating now, because they're all independent, if they all say the same thing, you can be pretty confident that the user is quite nervous. Now what's interesting about that is you could actually, um, when you implement your chatbots, there's a case for you to say to your customer, we should use video chat when you're talking to the chatbot. Because you could use video chat and you could be analy and no one's going to show you, you could actually analyze videos in real time as well. So in real time, you could be analyzing what's going on. And one of my colleagues from Australia here has got the training center and he was telling me that he's got this great idea of having a camera at the front of the training center. And the accuracy of these things is amazing and astounding. Um, I was playing with the stuff that Johan didn't. It was picking up text on a bottle that I couldn't see. But when we took the photo, it had worked, because the text was like, it was right on the edge of the bottle, so I could hardly see the text. And I don't know how it did it. It was picking up the text and, then, and got it right. So this stuff can be pretty accurate. So if you've got a training room, you can have a camera at the front with the student's permission, Andrew. You can have a camera at the front with all the student's permission. And <laughs> as the trainer is talking, you can have a little dashboard, right, in real time that maybe is just shown to the trainer saying, oh, there's a gentleman up there who's a bit grumpy with me. Oh, there's a guy down here that's yawning, like try to, try to get something exciting happening for him. So you could have in real time machine learning analyzing the experience that the students are having. Now imagine the difference between going to a training class where you can understand what the feeling is as you're doing the training as opposed to just like traditional training. Now in um, the stuff that Johan's gonna show you, even there you can look at a photo and see what their emotions are. And in this photo here, you can see that person number two has the emotion of being happy. Person number two just happens to be Johan Hedman. And you can see that the AI's got it right because he's about to come and present to you and he's quite a happy, jolly person. So over to you, Johan. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna go a little bit more technical than what Luke wants. Uh, but our, first, we're going to have to kind of explain what it's all about with the Amazon Recognition. Uh, so Amazon Recognition is a service. And like we've all been told here, the cloud. So this is a service within the cloud. This is a service that is learning itself for everyone is using this service. So it's becoming better and better for every day that someone is using it. It's a one API connection, so you don't have to connect to multiple different services to just ask for different services. It can not only handle images like you saw here when I was smiling at South Fork last year, it could also handle a lot of different things like real-time videos or batch-time videos. So it works a little bit like this. You have some kind of input, you send it through the Amazon recognition, it goes through that and analyzes every single bit of that and sends you back a result. The result comes back as tags that you can then put into like boundaries in an image or a video, or it could also give you a number of tags that you can create as records to show it within your app. So there are a lot of different services you can use for that Amazon recognition. I'm gonna go through some of them and I'm gonna explain how we use them. So the first one is for detect objects and scene and, and activities. And as you can see here, I'm on a cliff, I'm in the nature. Uh, it's a possibility of being in Kenyan here. And you can also see the, the confidence score on each one of these. 
So you can take any kind of picture and they will give you that kind of information out of that if you use that service. If you instead want to analyze your face or someone else's face, it will not only get you that boundary of where that face is in that image, it will also give you uh, facial expressions, accessories that might be part of your face, uh, and also positioning every single person that they can find in that image. So if you look into this uh, picture here of me, it could probably say, yeah, it's a gender of male, it seems to have her eyes open, uh, it's smiling a bit, and it's 100% scared of this moose here. Uh, but it could also detect all different other kind of things. It could get your eyes, your glasses, facial hair, and all other kind of things. If we want to do something more uh, real-time stuff, think about yourself looking into a football game. You want to know how many passes a specific player did, or you're following an expedition running around in the, the Tibetan uh, mountains trying to climb a high mountain, you can see exactly how many meters that specific person were running during that video. So this is not just useful for you and me, it could also be useful for business when you want to make money out of statistics. So like last year here when I went to South Fork and I met my idols from you know the old Dallas TV show, I was really happy when I actually got to see the Yar and Sue Ellen here. It could also detect celebrities. Not only person, but also like Grumpy Cat and other things that, that are so-called celebrities. And then, and then the same thing here. The more picture we put through this service, it's going to start to recognize more things. It could also detect text. So within a, an image that you take or a video, it will detect the text that goes by. So in here we have a, say, a sign saying, way to Island Peak. So it then picks up every single word out of that image, and then you can do whatever you want out of it. It can detect from an image up to 50 words, and it can go in any way you want. I'll show you proof of that a little bit later. It could also detect unsafe content, such as here when I'm jumping in between this cliff here, but it could also detect adult information. So if you want to have a secure way of handling your images, you can also use this service. For those who had one of these ones, like I had when I grew up, this is not the kind of videos we're talking about now. We are talking about the ones you're shooting from your iPhone or from a camera anywhere, like the ones we see on the streets right now when you walk uh, in the cities. These are the ones recording all time. They can record stuff, sending it up to this service, and get all kind of feedback coming back. So, yesterday we were told that we are supposed to be in the cloud. FileMaker is going hand in hand with Amazon. So for those who don't have a cloud, an Amazon account right now, I'm going to go really, really fast through how you get that. Because if you already have a FileMaker cloud, you already have one of these. Otherwise, you're most probably going to get one to be able to use they have a Claris Connect later on. So you go to awsamazon.com. You see a sign called Sign Up. You fill out your email, your uh, Amazon name. Then you have to fill out some of your address and all of that information for billing purposes and how they can contact you. You need to enter a credit card, and they're going to charge you one US dollar for setting up your account. After that, it's just up to you how much you use the different services, how much things going to cost you. So there's no monthly costing here. Once you have done that, you need to do some kind of confirmation that you are actually who you're saying you are. So you send them either your text phone for a voice call or a text message. And hopefully, you're going to get back a four-digit verification code that you enter here. And then you're going to get a confirmation that you successfully created your account. Now we, when we have that, we can start working with that integration. And like we have seen here today with Claris Connect, that's going to save us a lot of time setting that up. Like Chris Eppleit said on stage just before, this takes some time to make the integration to works. Uh, so you need to verify yourself being who you are. So what you need to do is you need to go into the security credentials of the Amazon account. And in there, you're going to need to find three things. First off, your secret key. 
Second of your access key is going to be for the every single service that you want to connect to. And then also you need to get your region. Amazon works in this way. They have a lot of different services, but not all of them are available in all regions. So this uh, service, uh, Amazon Recognition, is available, for example, in the US East one. So you always need to look that up, that you could probably not play around with a Japanese service in, in Sweden, where I live, for example, because it wouldn't be that relevant. So they have different services, and then they roll them out throughout all the regions, the better they become. So now that we have that integration up and running, we can start doing the demonstration. So like we said there, they have a demo where you can play around and see how that works. So if I take that same picture that I had before showing you, you can see that we all get different tags here. We get that cliff, uh, we get nature, we got to see a human. We can see we also got a whole bunch of other tags going on here. Besides that, we also get a respond. This respond is in JSON. And JSON is the way that we communicate with other APIs. So we can parse that information in any way we want. And I'm going to show you later on how we do that. If we instead took another picture and used the facial analyst, we can see that it picks up my face. It can say where my eyes, my nose, where my mouth is. It could also pick out the age. It can say my, my gender and a lot more other things. If we look into the deliberate one, you can see that they, it, it, they do think that uh, Linda Gray is in on this picture. They do think that Larry Hogman here but they didn't also think there's a guy called Mark Pellegrino. So they still have a little bit of learning to do. Uh, so I had to look this guy up. I didn't know who he was. And he's supposed to be played in National Treasure, the Big Lebowski, and the number one, number 23. So for those who are familiar with this guy, I, ha I still have a bit of reading up to do. You can also do face comparison. So say you have a user's table with a picture of your employees. I am not going to let them through the door this morning to start working until they appear in a sober state. So you can have a camera outside your, your uh, door taking a picture of you and then compare it to the other one. And then the door might open for you to get in. So here I'm comparing myself with uh, the celebrities and then another picture and then saying the similar, uh, similarity is quite high so I'm probably going to get through that door. If I do that same thing with the picture I took of Mark Pellegrino, they says there's no match here. So I'm not that equal to him after all. If we're using the text service, you can see here that it's not that easy to read this text. But it, even though we can still pick all of this information out of just that image. So it's really good of creating text. And it can go in any way you want, and it will still be really good. So think about this if you have an event or anything where you need to scan a lot of information. This would be a really good service for you to use. So if we look into what it could happen if we had a video, you can see here that we have a, a game playing of uh, strange football, really funny one. Uh, but he couldn't find any, any persons. He could see that there were six persons in the picture, but he couldn't really say any facial expressions or accessories like that. But he do find a lot of tags from the object and scene detection. And then the more you're playing this video, the more information is going to get in there. And then you can do whatever needed. So when you have something recorded, it could be real time, or it could be a batch time like this, where you just have a couple of videos or one video that you pull through the Amazon recognition. So I'm guessing you wonder, where do all of my images and videos turn up? So Amazon sets up something called S3 bucket for you. You don't even have to think about it. You don't have to do anything about it. An S3 bucket stands for a simple self-storage. So all your images are going to be stored there. Uh, and they store all images and all videos for you. So when you have that, that's the part that's going to cost you money. But it's almost going to cost you nothing. So for the first 50 terabyte of data that you upload, it's going to cost you 0.023 US dollars. So that's nothing. You can upload thousands of uh, videos before you're even going to reach that state. And the thing is, it gets better if you go over that in price. So you're going to lower that price. So you don't have to think about the cost for this service. It's almost for free. So if you have this service and you have some kind of input, you have a video analyzing your uh, employee's uh, batch uh, 
scan, and you have a scanner outside your door, that will then be saved into that S3 bucket. It will be recognized through the Amazon recognition who's on that badge, and then you might open a door, you might open the safety or whatever, opening a file, whatever is needed for you. It could be a part of your solution to open up a part of that for some certain customers, whatever is needed. Um, well, what I've done here is that I build an app that I'm going to hand out to everyone. So I'm going to give you a link later on this presentation where you can download this app. This is fully integrated with Amazon Recognition for three different services. And the rest you can just keep adding on as you want. I came up with this idea last year when I was at Jesse Barnum's uh, session about uh, AWS services when he said, yeah, there are tons of these other services you can use. So I looked in there and I found this one and I thought that would be something to talk about at next year, Stevcon. Uh, this app is going to be free for you to use, so you can put it in your solution whenever you, you want. It's more or less just a copy and paste. Hopefully I documented it good enough for you to just start using it straight off. If you have any questions about it or so later on after that, you feel free to contact me. This app works a little bit like this. So I installed it on my FileMaker Go. You can have it on FileMaker or anything else if you want to. It's going to open up. You can then choose to take a new picture or, or go for the one already existing. So here I'm going to take a new photo. And I'm going to take a photo of these three Coca-Cola cans. The, those, this image is then going to be sent to Amazon Recognition doing three services. First, the object in scene, then the text, and then facial analysis. The result that then comes back is going to give me not only this, the boundaries of each one of these cans, but also these 27 tags. These 27 tags will then might be useful for, like you, Luke said, to say there's three cans here, or any other kind of information that might be useful for you. So of course, I'm going to be technical. So I'm going to go a little bit under the hood on this one. Uh, so once you're opening up this app the first time, you need to enter your access key and the secret key that I talked to you about before. Once that is done, you're, not, you're never going to need to do that any, uh, anymore. That's just the first time. Then you get into this starting uh, part of the solution, where you choose either to go to the list of already existing ones to get out of this one, or you set up a new picture. Here, you can choose to take a new picture, or you can choose to take one from your own library. So we, when we use that, we can use that script step called insert from device. When you do take that, you, you choose your field that you want to store it to, and then you choose the options to store it with. So if we choose, for example, to use the camera, the camera have different options. Camera will look something like this. So first, you choose if you want to use the back or uh, the front of your iPhone. And then secondly, you can choose resolution. Amazon is smart. So the better resolution you send it off with, the more information you're going to be able to find. So probably better to choose the full resolution. Whereas if you instead go to choosing go with the video, you can then, again, choose the cameras options and the resolution option. But then all the optional ones for the camera is to have a maximum duration which could be a calculated one, or just the standard 60 that they have applied there. Not only that, you can also have it started immediately once you hit new photo. In the, in the app I built, I'm not using any video analysis, so it's just images. But you could have chosen that if you're building this out a little bit more. So the different options I can choose for when I want to put something into container from FileMaker Go is to put something from your music library, the photo library, which I'm using right here, the camera, a video camera, and then you can also go for a microphone, a barcode, and a signature. So the result that I get back in my app holds three different types of services uh, in, uh, results. So first is the one for object and scene detection, and that one is called labels. Secondly is the one with text, and thirdly is the one called faces. So it's going to group those with, you know, a sub summary report so you can see which one belonged to who. Uh, in FileMaker 18, we got this nice new feature called Crypt Generate Signature. This is exactly that function that's going to make it so much easier for you to connect to an API like Amazon Recognition. Because they are kind of demanding that you do 
a secure data transmission. So they're asking you for to, to encrypt your data um, so uh, using an encrypted algorithm that they will understand. This function will just do that for you. So if you haven't read about this one, this is the one to look into a little bit more. And then it's not that difficult. I'm just using that same function to call that service that I want to. So I'm asking for recognition service detect labels, the recognition service detect text, and recognition service detect faces. You see, I could just have added up more ones if I wanted here. If we look into how the script look, it might be a little bit small all the way in the back there. You see, I'm, I'm choosing the service that I'm taking my access key, my secret key, and then I'm doing a very, very important thing here. They don't want to send me the entire file. They want me to make this file base 64. This means I turn an image into text. And then I send all that chunk as text over to Amazon. They turn it around to an image or a video, come look through it, analyzing it, and then they send me back the, the result. So there are some options for the different kind of services. So all of them want you to send data as JSON. And as you can see here, when I'm setting my uh, post data here, you can see they only want me to send one and one only JSON tag called image bytes. That's the standard. So for example, if I were gonna go to faces, I can also add all attributes or just the ones needed for me. If I wanna to check to see if there's only wearing glasses or if there's only gonna have a mustache party, then you can check for that as well. You can also check for minimum confidence. So maybe you want to only have the ones where you have 80% of confidence that it's going to exist in your image. So um, then you need to set up your host, the region, the service name, and, and the headers for this. And, and it's pretty much straightforward. Uh, you already have chosen a region. Uh, we already have chosen the name for the service. Uh, we know uh, where we're going to post this on an HTTPS and then hit off. So I'm going to show you a little bit of code here. I'm not going to go into detail because once you get that file, you can play around with it yourself. And then I'm hoping I've documented every single thing here because I see there's a lot of documentation here. So we're setting a few variables into the right format, setting as a JSON, using JSON set form. Uh, then we are... Uh, that's different JSON tags, yeah. So we, um, once all of that are done, we make sure that we have all the JSON that is needed. And then we are verifying and validating that we have all the right formats in each one of those JSONs. So here we are validating the, our variables. And then after that, we also do some array trapping to make sure we have information in each one of those uh, JSON that we need. Then we're going to send off this information as SH256. And that's the way that Amazon requires us to do the algorithm for. So that's the encryption level that we're sending it off with. And once we have that, well, we need to do a, a signature. So we're writing a signature saying, this is me, this is my access code, this is the timestamp. And, and this is the region I want to call it for. Then we need to set up the URL for all of this. So the URL is going to be correct going for the different kind of services that we're asking for. And, and then we are setting up all different kind of curl options with the headers and all of that information that needs to go away. And then we're using the function called insert from URL. Insert from URL will then give us a response. We choose to get that response into a global variable. We could have chosen a field. And so the URL then looks like this to make sure that we have the right information in there. And then the last thing here is we're getting all those curl options and the data that needs to be sent in just one variable. Once all of that is gone, the URL are going to look something like this. So it's looking for the recognition part, the region, and then it's just going to Amazon. The data is going to be really hard for us to read. But what it's saying here is, I want to do this service. I want to use this specific image 
who's here, you can see it's been base64 encoded. And then we want to put it in JSON and send it off so it looks a little bit like this. And the curl options are through this. And you don't need to understand all the details here, but everything is set up so you don't have to do any changes. Back then comes the JSON. JSON is, for us, quite easy to parse. So the result can then be done uh, in any way we want. So we just pick out that JSON and do whatever we want to extract it. So then we need to parse that information. And parsing is something that's quite easy to do with FileMaker. So for each one of the different services, we need to parse things a little bit different. So for uh, labels, we create one record per tag that we can find in that JSON. So we are giving it a name, the family it might be part of, uh, the confidence score, uh, and the number of uh, occurrences within the image. So we are parsed that JSON out, like you see here, to get to those tags. If we then look at text, that one looks almost familiar to the one we did on, on labels to detect the information. And again, we create one new record for every tag that we get. Whereas if we go into faces, then all of the tags have different names and different behaviors. So first, we're checking to see if there's more than one person in that image. And then for each one of the different tags you can see here, we're creating a new record. And some of them are more than one. So for example, for uh, here you can see expressions and emotions. Those can appear several times. So therefore, we are doing a loop within the loop to get all that information. Because there could be a lot of emotions in one image. So we are just gathering information here, like the landmarks, to loop through that information within the image. So the result then could look something like this. So I get the boundaries. I get to see what's in there. I get the squares. And if I just hover over these images, I will be able to see what the tag is all about. So the result comes out as this. Uh, it's a list of different tags where you can look at those tags and look into, say, so here we have an outdoor. We go down a further bit. We can see that it has a, a west on. It's high confidence on that one. And that's a par the parent is clothing. We can keep going a bit further down. We can see there is a wilderness on this one. Uh, it's not such a high uh, confidence on that one. And then we have a person. It figure out the age. It could tell um, whether or not uh, what kind of gender there is. Uh, thank you for that one. And then it goes down. And lucky for me, I did uh, shave myself that day, so I didn't find any mustache. So here's the link to the app. Feel free to use it. Uh, we all have updates on our slides. You can always go back in and figure that one out later on if you want as well. But devcon at atatiki.com. I, I guess there's going to be a lot of questions regarding this one. And uh, for those who didn't attend that session, I'm glad you're here. But I'm very, very briefly going to say that this is going to change our future. Not only for the different app we can attach to, but also for artificial intelligence. So the, for the flows that they were going through earlier, you can do different things happening throughout everything so that a flow can happen in different order depending on what you do. If you want to take things up a notch and not just using a service that does everything for you, Amazon also have another service called Amazon Rec uh, SageMaker where you label your data sets, say where you have your different fields. You then build and train your data sets. You make sure that they have the, the right algorithm for your need. You then tune that up so it becomes in a way that you want to handle it and deploy it into, into your solution. This one is not reinforcing like the one with Amazon recognition. You need to do a little bit more work here. And with that, I'll have to tell you that I will be session updates on this one. And thank you very much for coming here. Make sure you fill out the evaluation forms. Thank you very much. Yes. Uh, for any questions, uh, I don't know. Please raise your hand. Yes.
So, I, I, yeah, that's a really good question. So the question was, if you have a, a, a wall with different things on and you want to recognize the number of things on that shelf, for example, and then you want to see and do stuff depending on the going back and forward in, in number of things on that shelf. Yeah. Yes, so uh, the reading that just took place here, the service, can read out almost anything. So this is just one service for it. There are multiple other services you can use to, to judge. They were using OpenML, which is something you can use on a Mac device to read things, for, for example, from your article database where you store the, the picture, the article information, the serial number, and all of that information. So, uh, let, let me, so I'll, I'll have a quick go at it. So, um, the way Johan just did it is exactly the way you will do it. It's just that when you take the photo of the part, instead of, he sent it off to a particular address, you can think of it as that. He sent it off to a particular machine learning, but it's just a particular address. That address, when it looks at an image, looks for stuff like, is there a face, is it outdoor? So that's what you saw him do today. Your one will just go to a different URL where the machine learning algorithm is different. And instead of looking for stuff like faces, it's got its own um, machine learning uh, database that's going on. And it's looking for things like part numbers and all the rest of it. So if it's a publicly known, if it's publicly known information, then maybe a server's already there. If it's private, in, and in your case, so your parts, will the part number be something that's open to the public or are the part numbers private to the vendor? It's probably private, I guess. Right, so. Okay, it's good that I get to answer a technical question because I normally don't get to answer any technical questions. <laughs> so the gentleman's saying, so does everyone understand what's going on? So the gentleman's got, he's got a company, he's got all these parts and he would love his guys to go out in the field and when they, exactly as we just saw in the keynote, they see a part, they take a photo of it and instead of having to stuff around, it says here's the part number and away they go, they can do their job. Okay, and I asked the gentleman if the part numbers are public because that's a pretty cool, critical question, right? Are these part numbers that the world knows about? In which case you could, you might be a service already there and you would call that pre-trained. So the machine learning algorithm is pre-trained, it's ready to go, you've got no work to do, it'll just give you back the part number but that would have to be a public one. The gentleman's saying he also has some private ones where no, the part number is not stored out there in the public. So here's, you'll need to use two different types of machine learning. The first machine learning algorithm you use is a pre-trained one if someone has provided that service. And I'll make a little note to come back to that. So pre-trained, saw a very interesting thing last year on that. Um, Go to the pre-trained one. So Heidi, actually, in the lightning talk that Heidi gave yesterday, she gave the best description or best example I've ever seen in my life on the difference between two types of machine learning, the pre-trained learning and the one where you've got to teach it yourself. So I'm just going to steal from, if you don't mind, Heidi, I'm going to steal from your session. I'll just talk you back through it, but you can go and look at her video later on. Here's what happened. She had, um, she I could put her on the spot and get her to talk through it, see how I go over this, Heidi. She had an example where she's got parts as well, right? So almost exactly the same as yourself. Instead of it being images, though, what she had was a catalogue of text. So there was a whole bunch of writing describing a certain part. She showed the pre-trained machine learning, went through the text to categorise it. And it got some of the categories right and some of the categories wrong. So for instance, it labelled a headphone set as a telephone, which is not great. So it goes through and it does this, and you see it happening in front of you within just a few seconds. She said, right, if I'm not happy with that pre-trained algorithm, I might have to go and train one myself. So there's a company called Monkey Learn. Again, just go up and start using them. Uh, yeah, M Monkey Learn. And actually, if you look at Heidi's, it's on video, look at her thing from yesterday, you'll be able to get to the details. With Monkey Learn, it showed the description, and because it got the, it, it said um, telephone, which was wrong. Feedback? You might just, um, so you got telephone, so it's wrong. So she relabeled it, and that's not a telephone, that's a headset or something like that. So she's relabeling stuff. And I kid you, watch the video, I kid you not, she got to like the 20 or 21st part, and the machine learning started getting it right. So when people tell you with machine learning you need massive amounts of data, send them the, I'm gonna cut that two minutes out of her video and send it to all my clients, and that's complete bollocks, because you can get to item number 20 and it starts getting it right. Now it's not gonna be great, but then if, if it's good enough that you can start using it, the more you use it, then the more accurate it gets. 
So it's a same, and I know that was a bit of a stretch because that was text. You're talking about images, but the same thing will happen. If you're talking about public images with barcodes that are out in the public, that should be pretty good if the service has been trained. If you're talking about private stuff, you'll need to train it yourself, but it is amazingly quick at getting smart, and then the more you use it, the smarter it'll get. So when they're out in the field, they'll take a photo. If the image is a public one, it'll get it straight away. If it's a private one, they'll just have a little thing in your app saying, is this correct? And if they say, no, it's not, what is it? They say what it is, and send the results back to the algorithm, and it teaches the algorithm, now you've got that wrong, buddy. This is what it should have been. And after you do that a few times, it'll start getting it right. The thing I wrote down here is there's a couple of uni guys, I think it was three or four of them, for their PhD, took photos of cabbages, and what they wanted to do was write prove a machine learning algorithm could distinguish between a good cabbage and a bad cabbage. So they did their thesis, they submitted it, you know, it all went very well, and then um, the tractor company, um, Kind of sells all the tractors. John Deere? Uh, John Deere. Yeah. John Deere approached them and said, we don't want to buy the algorithm. We don't want to buy the machine learning. We want to buy the thousands of photos you got you and all your friends to go and take of cabbages. So that learning thing, that ability to learn it, because they were uni students, they had all these people helping them out, they had a huge library of photos of cabbages that were only just slightly different to each other. They sold it to these guys for like millions of dollars. And the value wasn't in the algorithm, right? It was in the labor that it took to train the algorithm so that it was so precise. What did John Deere do? They took cameras, put on these irrigators, and as the irrigator goes over the top of a field of cabbages, it could identify instantly which ones should have been rejected and which ones were okay. So John Deere looked at what they did and went, yeah, I don't, we don't want to pay people to go and do this, we'll just use that. That was a long answer, that was such a good <laughs> question. And the reason why we spent so much time answering that, that question, is so perfect, that's so on topic of what we're doing today. And I realize that some of you haven't been like toying around with this. So I realize if you're hearing it for the first time, I'm hoping that even people that didn't ask the question found that helpful because we're reinforcing some of the stuff that Johan showed you. And hopefully that answered the question. Oh, what? And he still gave me a, well, then you have to come and buy us a beer later and we'll get into more detail. But I think we better take another question. The gentleman behind you. I was, totally, I was totally wondering if we I mean, that's actually quite polite. You've been, you've been quite good to us with that question because if you want to think about what um, machine learning is already doing and if you want to think about the fact that you take photos of people and identify from that how they're feeling and honestly, it's, I, for you, I'm hoping there's people here that, that take, is surprised by that, that it can be so damn accurate. So if you can actually understand how people are feeling and be pretty accurate in your prediction, Thank you, sir, for being so polite, just talking about privacy. I mean, there's, huge, there's even bigger issues that come from the back of that. All I'll say to, to that question is, have you seen the documentary called The Hack? Yeah. So hands up if you've seen that documentary. No, I have not. OK, so there's a few hands came up here, and I don't know if you've seen I it seen yet. It. You've seen it? Yeah. So hands up again, because it's about networking, right? So look at up here. There's one there, one there, one there, and one there. So if you don't want to take my word for it, talk to those people. There's a whole documentary about this, go and watch it. It's all about Cambridge Analytica. So Cambridge Analytica got their hands on data from Facebook, and, I, and for those of you that are from the US, apparently Cambridge Analytica had 5,000 data points on each of you, without your knowledge. And then a gentleman tried to get to that information. So like, if I'm from the US, I went up, got my lawyer, and said, I just, in terms of privacy, look, I just want to know what you've got on me. I don't need to see what everybody else got, but what are your 5,000 data points on me? And he couldn't get to it. So then it got blown up bigger and bigger and bigger because they wouldn't even give him his own information. So then it went and there was an inquest and there was all sorts of stuff going on. So if you want to hear what the government thinks about it and what the experts, what the lawyers think about it, who are much more qualified to answer that question than I am, just watch the documentary called you know, the, the Hack. That's the right name of it, isn't it? It's got The Hack. Sorry? Netflix. It's on Netflix. There you go. It's a freebie. No. Is there any no. So you can read in through what an S3 bucket is, and yes, they're saying it's a simple self-storage, but it doesn't give you detail to get in there. So when you put stuff up on using Amazon Recognition, you can say, I'm storing my stuff here, so you can use that as a file reference, or you can just upload it, and it's going to end up being there. So you can self-go in and see what you have. But what they are doing with the image, they don't really say. 
but they are saying that's your storage. And I quite like that the slide we saw today um, when Srini wrote, you've got your idea or your vision, and then there's like the business process, and then there's the technology. You're asking, I think, a question about the business process or about something that's not the technology. So we're all here excited about the technology, and I think that's all we're qualified to talk about, so I don't think we should go off that topic. But I cannot agree with you more. There's a whole field of business processes and privacy and all sorts of philosophical issues that need to be addressed because this is absolutely a new and disruptive technology. So great question, but I don't think we're qualified at this conference to go into it too much. Thank you. Thanks. Any other questions? Yes? Now, so that one Luke did by himself straight out of FileMaker. But last year, we had a session directly pointing to how you can pick a chatbot. We also had a brief discussion about it yesterday in our lightning talk. But if you look into the slides, you will get a, a direction to where we had that slide last year. So you can learn a lot more from what we did last year, where we did actually put a live chatbot within the FileMaker solution and work out how that works together. Yeah. No. So the no, no. chatbot itself no, no is a service. It, so it's a, it is a service from the dialog flow. Is it, is it an AWS service? That's what I'm no, so, that was, one is a Google. It's Google's Go API. So, so Google Google's have a, a, a chatbot shortly here called dialog flow. That is really good to do small talk. You don't have to do that uh, learning for. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then. You are learning it by setting entities and attributes to get you started to connect your database to it. That's why we chose to go through that last slide. But we're not here for chatbots today. But there's that video there, that goes for an hour, and that whole topic was only about that. And so we didn't want to repeat what we did last year, so we come up with the new stuff today. Oh, no, not you, Ned. Is there anyone else, is there anyone else besides Gary that has a question? Oh, we're going to have to ask. OK, then, go on, then. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. Do the people the first time I've seen Do the people at the back hear that? Could you hear that okay? So Gary was just saying that a another a great example of this is this company where you've got to identify yourself, so you show that so you take a you know shot of your, your driver's license. But what they got you got the you to do was do a video where you hold the driver's license next to you. And it was doing that check that Yohan showed you. Is the face that's on the license the face of the guy that's showing the card? And this was something. Yeah. And I think, and I mean, Johan mentioned it briefly. I'm not sure if it dropped, but that idea of you having not just photos of your employees, but all the photos in your database can then be matched to stuff that's happening in the outside world. So, especially in your case where you've got these parts. If there was no machine learning out there, you could just take the photos yourself of your parts and have a database of your own photos and then use that one that says, is this photo the same as that one? And what's awesome about that is when they're out in the field, if that, oh, that's full. If they're going, oh, this is the thing, they take a photo, and then the next time, is that the thing, they take a photo, and then it's take that. So it doesn't matter, and the thing might be behind a tree or there might be a shadow. These machine learning algorithms are great and saying, no, that is, the, that is the same as that photo that's in your database. So now you've got a match, and then away you go with your solution. No more questions? Well, thank you very much, everybody. Appreciate you coming to this one.